Okay, guys. So we are welcome back. In case you're not seeing the vid this video, then it means um you've not watched the first and second video. First video was we did that one on um introduction to uh, learning. We discuss what what learning is and what learning is not, and some um relative um topics. We've also talked about classical conditioning, and this is the continuation. So um, even if you're not joining us, you make sure you later watch the previous um, videos. Once again, for the purpose of YouTube, we'll be posting this on YouTube. So let me do the YouTube stuff. Um, YouTube stuff that we, we get uh, related. We will be related with the video. My name is Siddiq Salis, and if you're seeing this, for the first time, it means you're new to, if you're hearing the things you're seeing right now, for the first time, the things you're seeing, um, such as high order or such as NS and CS, it means you are not in level 300. You should be in level 100. If you're level 300 or 200, definitely you can uh, relate to these terms. So where we've gotten to, we've discussed a whole lot about classical conditioning. We've discussed the elements, some elements in classical conditioning, um, such as, NS, that's neutral stimulus, CS, conditioned stimulus, which elicits a conditioned response. We've discussed about all this. Pairing neutral stimulus, neutral stimulus with unconditioned stimulus, which will initially, from the beginning, will give you um, unconditioned response. Then later, the neutral stimulus, we said it will become, the neutral stimulus will become a conditioned stimulus. And if it is presented even without an unconditioned stimulus, it will still elicit conditioned um, response. Without wasting of much time, if you have not watched the previous video, you make sure you watch that on Faculty of Intellectuals. Okay, I think I'm uploading that. I've uploaded the second one as well. So you can impress yourself with that. Now let's continue. Okay, so high order conditioning. What does this mean? This means that this simply means I'm summarizing as usual as I do. Higher order means you see sometimes we may present two conditioning uh, conditioned uh, how do you call it stimulus. Okay, when we do that, one will uh, how do you call it? Uh, Do I say uh, overshadow? When we condition, let me put it this way. When we conditioned, uh, how do you call it? Uh, from the beginning, let's, let's take the bell and the food. The bell and the food, that is our neutral stimulus with unconditioned stimulus. The neutral stimulus becomes conditioned stimulus at the end, which we've explained how it becomes, right? So it will start eliciting, it will start eliciting conditioned response. However, we can then bring in another conditioned stimulus, which will be a neutral stimulus from the beginning. So pay attention. So we already have this neutral stimulus, uh, conditioned stimulus, okay? So in the case of the Pavlovian studies, let's call this um, the bell. Do I have a bell here? Okay, I think I have something like a bell. <laughs> okay, so let's have the bell. Okay, then um, let's have another thing. So the bell was the one eliciting response, okay? Eliciting conditioned response, make the dog salivate in expectation of meat powder. That's unconditioned stimulus. Now, I can then present something else. Okay, which would then be a neutral stimulus for me to turn this bell, which was a conditioned stimulus, for me to turn it into, uh, how do you call it? Uh, for me to turn it into 
uh, unconditioned stimulus, let me say. Okay, so the bell wouldn't, this bell wouldn't turn into unconditioned stimulus because I bring something above that. So it says that once the dog is conditioned to salivate at the sound of the bell, the bell subsequently acts as unconditioned stimulus. So that's it. As it is paired with another neutral stimulus, such as a clap, for example. So in this case, let's take this small one. They are all, so this should be like a clap. Okay. So a clap. Before the bell. So now this clap, okay, when they clap, before the bell will ring. When they clap, before the bell will ring. At a point when there is a clap, the bell will then be rung, still with the expectation of what? Meat powder. In this case, this clap, this new clap, this new thing, the neutral stimulus, will then be a conditioned stimulus. Why? Because the dog will not be responding to it. But this is there high, in high order. This will be of low order because it will become, uh, this, I say low order, will become a low stimulus because uh, there is something that has overtaken it. And therefore, this is going to be unconditioned stimulus. So when you hear higher or high order, when you hear high order, it means the conditioned stimulus has been turned into unconditioned stimulus by the present of a new neutral stimulus, which would then eventually become the condition stimulus. Basically, that is what high order is all about. Let me use exa an example here, um, using day-to-day uh, -day stuff, like I normally do in the class, okay? This is online, so you know, I can't say certain things. I understand, not everyone that know, uh, knows me on that level. So I'm trying to be, you know, Professionals. <laughs> Maybe it will not even work. The professionalism will not even work. Anyways, so let me use, for example, um, your husband met you, or you are the one who met the lady both ways. So you met your partner, a lady. For the first time, you want her to like you. So therefore, you associated it with money. Okay? Then, so anytime you give her money, she knows that um, you have to go into the inner room. Anytime you give her money, you have to go into the inner room. Now, there can be something that you can bring on board and it will be, it will um, be of high order, okay? It will be of, and then the money will become like unconditioned stimulus. So for example, you start winkling. I've done this example in class before, okay? So anytime you want to give her the money, so that you go to the chamber, you winkle. So when you winkle, what will she be? In the beginning, it was a neutral stimulus. She doesn't understand. But you winkle the first time, you give her money. You winkle the second time, the second day or the third day, you give her money. So anytime you winkle, you give her money. Now, the money will not be the condition for going to the inner room. Okay? Now, it will be the winkling. When you winkle, she'll be expecting money. And then, you see, so that's an example. That's high order. So now the money will become unconditioned stimulus and the winkle becomes conditioned stimulus. That's good if you answered that anyways. Okay, so let's continue. I think we've already done this. So after pairing the clap and the bell, this time the clap is presented alone and the dog salivates. So after some time, then you can take away the money. When you winkle, you go into the room. You understand? Good. Okay, as a result of the association that has been formed, Okay, so let's move on. So we talk about acquisition. When you say acquisition, that's the overall process of the conditioning. That's acquisition. So we are not talking about the features, how you cannot recognize classical conditioning. It has the feature of acquisition. Acquisition, like I said, that is pairing the neutral stimulus, okay? The overall process of conditioning. And that's in, the sim in simple terms. When we, you are being asked, what is acquisition? You say that is the overall process of conditioning an organism in classical conditioning. Okay, so you pairing neutral stimulus with um, unconditioned stimulus, and eventually the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus, and then eventually you present the conditioned stimulus alone, and then it elicits conditioned response. This is called acquisition. Okay, so the development of a conditioned response as a result, conditioned response is like 
now conditioning the organism as to respond in a certain way under a condition. As a result of the continuous pairing of the conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus. So that's acquisition, basically. Um, factors affecting acquisition. I told you from the beginning, I, I wouldn't be paying attention to certain things uh, I would deem um, irrelevant. But do not, after the class, you can still read on these things because this one we'll talk about it in, uh, in the different uh, slides. So let's continue. Extinction. You've had this over and over again from level 100. So extinction is like the failure of the acquisition. Okay. Extinction, it means um, to quench the acquisition. The acquisition is what? When the conditioned stimulus is presented, when the conditioned stimulus is presented, such as the um, let's say the money or the winkle. Okay, when you winkle, you dash someone money. When the organism, such as the dog, stops to respond to the bell, and there's a reason behind that. I'm repeating that again. When the organism, such as the dog, stops to respond, meaning to behave under a condition, stop to respond to the bell. There's a reason. The reason is the unconditioned stimulus is not presented after the conditioned stimulus, meaning the meat powder, the unconditioned stimulus, uh, unconditioned stimulus does not follow the conditioned stimulus. You know, they were just presenting the bell alone. They were just ringing the bell alone, and the dog was salivating in expectation of what? The unconditioned stimulus. I told you the unconditioned stimulus is what the organism likes or dislikes. So if that one is no more following, then we as organisms, or even the dog, will stop responding conditionally to the bell. When this happens, we say there is an extinction. So from today, know what an extinction is. That is when uh, extinction takes place when the organism stops to respond to the conditioned stimulus. Due to the fact, due to, due to the fact that the uh, the unconditioned stimulus does not follow the conditioned stimulus. Okay, if this is sounding fast to you, it will be uploaded, so you can still go back and uh, watch. Okay, okay. Now let's go to the next one: spontaneous recovery. That is like reacquisition. Spontaneous recovery is just by like. After some time, you know, after some time, during the Pavlovian studies, after some time, they, they stop ringing the bell. Okay, they stop ringing the bell. And after some time, they rang the bell again. When they rang the bell, the dog then start to, um, how do you call it, salivate again. And this happens in most cases. Let's take your husband who always winkles to you and then gives you money. Let's take it. Let's take that as an example. He gives, um, how do you call it? Let me even turn it. Let me even turn it the other way around. Maybe we are used to this one. Let's, let me turn it the other way around. Let's say anytime you people do something, he gives you money. When you go to the inner room, he gives you, let's say, 100 cities. So anytime he calls you to the inner room, you are in the expectation that, oh, I'll get some 100 cities for shawarma. Okay, shawarma. Shawarma. Then he takes you to the inner room, the chamber. One particular day, money didn't come. Another day, money didn't come. Another day, money didn't come. The next time he calls you, be like, hey, master, master, but with Jimmy and Bam and and me, I'm a me, I'm That's how we are going to respond to it. That's how you are going to respond to it. Be like, Charlie, me, tell me. You understand? But then after a while, after a while, if This where is the inner room and what happens there? Uh, if you don't know the inner room, uh, if you don't come in here, they will not write in the room. Derek, you are not my... <laughs> okay, so after some time, you may be, you will be there and then when he calls you, you go in the expectation that money will come. You understand? 
So I I used to use um for example music. I used to use music as an example. There's a particular music you listen to. Let's say with someone. Okay, then the person travels. What do you think will happen if the music is being played after the person travel? You have memories of that person. Oh, you wish the person was here. The presence of the person will be missed. But if the music continues to play, 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 it will not, and the person is not coming, it will not elicit any response from you again. That is extinction. Then the music stops. After some months, you hear the music somewhere again. That memory will come back again. That is spontaneous recovery. That is spontaneous recovery. Let's move to the next. Stimulus generalization. So always use this. When one man fails you, and then you say that men, eh? that's how they are. That is stimulus generalization. <laughs> one person just Break small, broke small rib of your small. And then you said, that's how women are. Small rib. They didn't even touch the kidney. He said, that's how men are. You are. Okay, so that's. When the organism responds to the condition stimulus in the Pavlovian studies, such as the bell, when this the dog started to respond, meaning salivate, even when he hears other things that are not uh, actually uh, the bell, which was the initial condition stimulus. The bell was the initial conditioned stimulus. Then the dog was responding to even cooking utensils. Then you know that this is called stimulus generalization. Anything that sounds like the bell, the dog was responding to it. When you were in level 100, I think, or in level 200, I gave you this example, like you act from the family of um, yogurt. You know, they have different types. So you add, let's say, the mango. And then you decided that, and you had some aversive experience, okay, a bad experience. You vomited. Then anytime you see any family member of this yogurt product, you feel like vomiting. Or you had you you get back uh, the, those memories get back to you. This is also stimulus generalization. Okay, so let's move to the next ones. Discrimination, stimulus discrimination is the opposite. When it is only one man, this man broke your heart, but then you don't generalize it to the other people. When you don't generalize it to the other people, that's discrimination. Here it means that you're only responding to the initial uh, condition stimulus. Okay, you are responding to the initial condition stimulus. I hope you understand this. Okay, so in the case of the Pavlovian studies, when the dog was responding to the bell, assuming that when utensils, cooking utensils, or any metal, metallic object um, sounds like the bell, the dog does not respond to them, but rather respond to the bell, the initial bell alone. That is stimulus discrimination. Higher order conditioning. So that's the next topic, which is also um, a feature. Higher order conditioning, it occurs, it occurs established, it occurs established. Uh, what is the CS uh, condition stimulus is then paired repeatedly with a, another neutral stimulus. It is, I think we've discussed this already, right? Higher order, I think we've discussed that already. After the dog in Pav after the dog in Pavlov's experiment has learned to salivate at the sound of the bell, then it is repeatedly exposed to a light followed by the bell without presenting the meat powder. Later, when the dog sees the light and hears the bell, it will begin responding to the light by salivating. I think we've discussed this already, so you are familiar with higher order. I use an example like Winkling. Winkling and giving money. Initially, you were giving money, but now you winkle before you give the money. So that is a higher order. Okay, so this is a, a pictorial form of um, classical conditioning in, in, uh, in terms of higher order. I hope you understand this. Okay, so overshadowing. 
Overshadowing usually is, now we know higher order, okay? Overshadowing is when you present two condition stimulus, two or more. I'll give you a, a classical, uh, I say classical, uh, practical example. You present two, or, because someone may ask, how can you present two or more condition stimulus? It happens just in the expectation of one, con con one unconditioned stimulus. So let's say you present two or more conditioned stimulus, okay? But definitely, one is going to elicit the response more than the others or more than the other. One is going to actually condition and elicit the response, the conditioned response than the others. When this is happening, we say that one has overshadowed the rest of their conditioned stimulus. Okay? I believe we understand this. So let's take an example. Um, a siren. Hearing of a siren. And it's light. Siren has a light. And then a police car, a police vehicle, three condition stimulus. Sometimes we can just see a police, when we are driving, we see a police car, especially in the afternoon, and we just respect ourselves. When you are driving, you see the police car, and then if you want to do overtaking, you see, so it's, you give a conditioned response just by seeing what? A police, um, vehicle right what are you expecting you expect a police officer who will arrest you right so you are you i told you unconditioned stimulus is something you like or dislike so you dislike arrest since you dislike you dislike arrest what do you do you your your behavior is conditioned to respect the rules to obey the rules of the road so you just um give a certain response to it Sometimes not only the sight of the police car. In the evening, you hear siren. Wow, wow, wow. That's a sound. You may also see a flashlight. Okay. Before even seeing the police vehicle. Now, when these two, let's say the siren, let me take even the two alone, the siren, and then the light. One will elicit response more than the other definitely it's can be it differs from species to species with something like rats for them the auditory is faster as humans our vision is faster okay so you hear you, you see lights you are driving and then you see light in the traffic you start you may not even know whether it is police vehicle or um this normal ambulance or whatever but you just maintain you just respect the rules of the road. You understand? If you want to do overtaking, you just give. So it will elicit a conditioned response from you. And that is, you are scared of what? Arrest. Or to be charged by the police. Or what we call in law, strict liability. You're running away from strict liability. So therefore, you maintain the rules of the road, the laws of the road. Okay? So in this case, although there are two things that conditions our response, which is what? the siren, the sound, and then the sight, the light, the lightning. But one has overshadowed the other. That is overshadowing. So when two or more conditioned stimulus are paired with a single unconditioned stimulus, the more silent of the two conditioned stimulus would produce, the more it is uh, silent of the two conditioned stimulus will produce the strongest condition response. So the one that uh, is well relatable to the organism will actually elicit the condition response. For example, a flashlight, and I think we have done this, flashlight and a siren are both predictors of an emergency vehicle. Anyways, we've done this already. So let's move to the next um, slide, the next session, I mean. We are done with this session as well. If you seek to know, this, I think, is session three. Okay. So I'll be rushing this as, as usual, and I hope I'm not rushing too fast. Okay. Trying to get back the next one, which is a continuation. We 
continuation of classical conditioning. Okay, so let's continue. In the next 10 minutes, we may go off and then we'll come back. Um, no, I think we'll not come back now. We'll, come, we'll, we'll do that in the morning tomorrow, um, somewhere in the morning, yeah. But then today, what we are going to do right now, what we're going to do is we'll be going into the application of classical conditioning. Okay, there's some part I'll just ask you to go and read because like I said, I'll deem, I deem it not to be relevant at this point where you are preparing for exam. The role of contiguity. Contiguity just means, or contiguity just means like when, like uh, these are factors uh, that affect classical conditioning. So there are some things that will either may either strength or do strength classical conditioning or weakens it. Okay, when you want to condition your wife, condition your husband, condition your children to behave in certain way, condition your workers, condition this and that. We should know that there are factors that affect uh, the conditioning. One of it is the role of contiguity. Contiguity just means um the meeting of one thing to the other, the contact, okay? The contact of one thing. So if we are holding hands, that's the contiguity, okay? Like, should I say the proximity? Okay, so the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus should be closer, so that is it, closer, to bring a stronger association between them. So, the, so no, contiguity just means the closeness of something. So when you present the conditioned stimulus, there shouldn't be much delay. There shouldn't even be delay before pre uh, presenting the unconditioned stimulus. So when you ring the bell, it should be followed immediately with the, um, how do you call it? The meat powder, okay? For you to have a strong, so it means when there's a delay, if, if you delay it, it means we are going to have a weak conditioning. And if you don't delay, we will have a strong condition, conditioning. So that is the role of contiguity. Let's move to the next one. Okay. I think we are done with the uh, rule of contiguity. So we move to the next one. That is um, the types. Okay. Here we are looking at this, not the factors. Types. Different types of temporary relationships. So people have done different studies to come out with different ways of conditioning apart from the classical um, studies by Ivan Pavlov. So we had we have forward purring, delayed conditioning, stimulus conditioning, backwards conditioning, trace trace conditioning, and then temporal conditioning. So let me see if I can summarize this in a nutshell. Forward pairing. When you hear forward pairing, please, that is the Ivan Pavlov studies, the normal one. The normal one is that the Conditioned stimulus will be presented, such as the bell will be rung, followed by unconditioned stimulus, right? We know this. So that is forward. Condition comes, condition stimulus, that's the CS, count before the unconditioned stimulus. So when you present the conditioned stimulus before the unconditioned stimulus, and it should be immediate, there shouldn't be delay. Okay, that is forward pairing, the normal Pavlovian studies. Condition stimulus first, followed by unconditioned stimulus to elicit conditioned response. This is called Forward pairing, delayed conditioning. Delayed conditioning, there is delayance between the conditioned stimulus, which should be followed by the unconditioned stimulus, but there is a delay between the two. That is delayed conditioning. Stimulus, uh, sorry, simultaneous conditioning. That is presenting the two at the same time. Presenting the unconditioned stimulus, meaning the arrival of the, or the onset of the conditioned stimulus and that of the unconditioned stimulus comes at the same time. Okay? Backwards conditioning. That is presenting, uh, how do you call it? Um, uh, how do you call it? Presenting the unconditioned stimulus, such as the meat powder, before the conditioned stimulus. Some scholars say, when this happens, you are presenting the meat powder before the bill. Some scholars say then there is there wouldn't be any conditioning here anyways. Then we have temporal conditioning, which uh, we'll get to that 
later because that's the list. So let me keep that for the later. So let's start with this forward pairing. With this, the onset of the condition stimulus precedes the onset of the unconditioned stimulus. It is the usual Pavlovian experiment where the blah blah. So that's it. Let's move to the next one. So you can see this um, indication. There's no much difference. If you look at the presentation of the first one and then the second one, okay, you can see that there's no much time difference. It's just immediate. Okay, the next 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 one is delayed. This is where the interval between the presentations of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus is quite long. Okay, I don't have time. That's why I'm moving parts like that. Our time is almost up here, four minutes. Okay, so as you can see, there's a bit kind of, there's a delay kind of, okay, before um, the response, the condition response. Simultaneous. The conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus have on uh, have onset at the same time because at the same time because they are both presented together at once. So unconditioned stimulus are the same. Uh, sorry, this means that the onset and offset. Some people are were joining. That's why uh, my attention was a bit off. This means that the onset and offset of the conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus are the same time. <laughs> Backward, we've explained that. So that one is easy to understand. It's the opposite of the first one, of the, fo of the forward conditioning. So the unconditioned stimulus is first presented and taken off, followed by the presentation of the conditioned stimulus. <laughs> see this, see this comment by some, See the scholars by Doc. He said, there's almost no conditioning with this procedure. There's almost no conditioning. Okay. Trace conditioning. Did I explain trace conditioning? Okay, if not, trace conditioning is basically um, they present the condition stimulus, then it will be taken off for some time before, uh, how do you call it? The unconditioned stimulus. Here it says the onset and offset of the Conditioned stimulus occurs some time before the unconditioned stimulus is presented. Remember, in the Pavlovian studies, it's immediate. After the conditioned stimulus comes, immediately unconditioned stimulus follows. That's the Pavl Pavlovian study. But with this, there will be presentation of the conditioned stimulus. Then it will be taken off. So the conditioned stimulus comes on and then off. That is. It ceases before the arrival of the unconditioned stimulus, making it more difficult for a conditioned response to be formed. If a conditioned response is even formed at all, this uh, it is weak and unstable. Temporal conditioning. I wish we can finish before the time elapses. Okay, in this case, in, so temporal conditioning, this kind of conditioning, no condition stimulus is presented. So that is it. With temporal, the unconditioned, let's pay attention to the temporal. The unconditioned stimulus is its own conditioned stimulus. The, the meat powder is its own conditioned stimulus. Can you imagine? So that is with temporal. So what does it mean? The, let's say the meat powder will be presented and it will be taken off. Now, when it is taken off, what should the dog be expecting? It should The dog should be expecting that it will be presented again. So here, what do you think will be actually the condition stimulus? The actual condition stimulus here will be the time. Will be the time. Time here will be there. So when you present it and you take it off, and you see, the time you'll be presenting it, the dog will be expecting that, oh, the food, that, meaning the food is ready. So the time here will be the conditioned stimulus. I hope you understand from here. Okay. So you condition stimulus. So we'll pause here. The time is almost up. Then we'll go to uh, factors. Then we'll go to the... Uh, so we have to come back again because we are not done with what I want us to finish with. That's use of classical conditioning, the application. Okay, so we'll go back and then we'll resort to that again, starting from here. So I think that'll be 10 minutes. Uh, that'll be 10 minutes.